Hi everyone, welcome to Money Dance. And uh, as you know, we uh, at Money Dance have been doing a six day long uh, discussion series with, uh, with important people in the space. And it's my great pleasure today to bring to you one of the original OGs in crypto, Kathleen Brightman. Kathleen is famous for a lot of things. And one of the main ones, of course, is, uh, is the role she played as one of the two founders of the Tezos chain. And uh, she is currently running her own company, uh, looking at uh, building interesting NFT-based games on top of blockchains. So, but today I want to talk to her broadly. And essentially, this is our chance to tap into her wisdom. And uh, I'm sure as you'll, you'll see in two seconds, she's very spirited and opinionated. And I want to hear from her, uh, you know, what she makes of, uh, of, of the DeFi space, of the crypto space overall, and uh, what her vision is. That's the goal of the discussion. But Kathleen, maybe let's start with, um, with, uh, uh, with the, uh, the entry uh, into crypto. Uh, what was your entry into crypto? And do you remember how we met? Oh, yeah, no, thank you for having me. Good. It's really nice to be here. Um, yeah, well, you know, I jokingly say that I married into cryptocurrencies. Um, I was working at a hedge fund back in 2013 when Bitcoin had its first like really big foray into uh, the popular press. And um, my husband, Arthur, was already like far deep into crypto. Um, he was on the cryptography mailing list for Bitcoin was announced so on and so forth. He has a very cryptic um, email in his drafts from like 2009 saying like should look into this Bitcoin thing and he never did. Um, but around 2012 or 2013, it's pretty much all he would talk about. And, uh, and so I had a if you can't beat him join a moment. Um, and I, you know, I found that it was actually much more interesting than my day job. Um, and so I, I kind of got into it. And then I was working at Accenture in like 2015 when the whole like blockchain, not Bitcoin thing um, started to take off in, in the minds of different corporates. And that led to me kind of going into this full time. Um, and in 2016, a lot of the ideas from the Tezos position paper, um, which was published in 2014, um, kind of became in vogue. And I was sort of the logical Brightman to um, to sort of lead the charge towards doing something that looked like a launch at the time. Um, and so, yeah, at around 2014, um, you know, this this position paper was released, and you were actually one of the one of the people who kind of tweeted about it and said, you know, paid a nice compliment uh, to the ideas before it was even sort of popular to think about governance. The, at the heart of Tezos is the recognition that Bitcoin lacks a mechanism to upgrade itself. And that, you know, innovation could be stewarded in, in a more like, I guess, uh, efficient way um, by, by basically having a formal governance mechanism. Um, what's notable about this is that it predates the sort of Bitcoin civil war that was like heavily popularized in 2015, which you were also, of course, a very, um, you know, noted commentator on. So um, we've been following your career with interest for a while. And I guess you are as in, you know, obviously became an advisor to the Tezos project at some point. So. Thank you. Yeah, I, I remember. Uh, I remember when the Tezos paper got circulated among the IC3 directors, and it was an eye-opening moment for me. I was like, "Whoa, there's so much here, um, both stated and unstated." The stated part is governance. The unstated part is the need for flexibility. Mm -hmm. So, um, and uh, until then, the idea was, "Hey, these things are whatever they are on day zero. They can never change." You are, uh, you know, we will take down the man and now we will be slave to algorithms. And uh, <laughs> our creator by definition has to be perfect because, you know, we live under his rule for all eternity. And, I mean, uh, to be fair, it makes really great religion. It makes like pretty miserable software, right? Exactly, so, <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. And, and yeah, from Tezos, I learned quite a bit myself. Um, so, uh, okay, but so, so you're at the, at the, you know, at the, at the sort of half helm of, uh, or if anybody's at the helm, of, uh, <laughs> of a big, big uh, successful project. And uh, you know, the biggest criticism that's levied against these projects, um, against any project is, oh, that thing is not decentralized. Mm -hmm. That thing is just a toy. And to be fair, of the 6,000 uh, chains out there, most are not decentralized at all and have no hope of becoming decentralized. Um, yeah. So what's your ongoing definition for decentralization? What are, how do you measure this? What, what is it that you seek in a successful project? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I'm also curious to hear your, you know, definition and answer to it, but I'll go first. So, I mean, there's a very strict definition of like decentralization, which just means that no one a priori has like a privileged role in the algorithm like that, you know, level sets everything. And that actually makes the, um, yeah, it makes it kind of hard to define from a social perspective. Like once you get beyond the technology, this is ultimately consensus building software, right? Um, 
I guess, you know, I, I think of everything in comparison to Tezos because obviously it's what I, both what I know best and what I believe in the most. Otherwise, you know, I'm, I'm in, you know, deep shit. But, um, but basically, you know, the way I think about it is this, like, there was an upgrade that happened to Tezos last week and I had absolutely nothing to do with it, right? Like traditionally, if you have a sort of software project that's centrally managed, um, you have to have someone signing off on any sort of upgrade. And that can be like a cabal of people. It can be, you know, one person. But but with, with Tezos, for example, you, there's a hot swap on the protocol. There's kind of nothing you can do about it, which is both extremely scary, um, but it also is a testament to the decentralization and the design of the, of the project. Basically, um, you know, the best entrepreneurs that I, I can think of are the ones who built something that's like much bigger than themselves, like the Steve Jobses and, and whatnot, the Jeff Bezoses. Um, they have these massive institutions that just like exist beyond their, their peril. And part of it is that you imbue a culture um, and you also imbue like processes uh, that allow you know, people to thrive and make decisions in your absence. And so like really, you know, I, what I think of, um, what I'm proud of with Tezos is that it very much lives beyond me and Arthur um, and no one really like looks to us to, to, to do things. Um, the first upgrade was this sort of vanilla vote. It was called Athens. Um, they're all named after like sort of ancient cities. And uh, Athens was sort of a, do you like vanilla or chocolate? Like not a very controversial choice <laughs> um, by design, right? And like literally- Vanilla and chocolate is a controversial choice. It does. <laughs> <laughs> it's not anything like technically objectively correct, right? <laughs> um, but uh, it's like clearly chocolate. Anyway, um, but okay. I'll just say, uh, you know, no one asked for my opinion. Um, and I thought that, that was awesome. And I, you know, advertised that. And then someone asked my opinion on the next one. I was like, God damn it, you know, you <laughs> ruined my track record. But um, yeah, I mean, I think like, at, you know, there's, there's a technical definition and there's a substantive definition. The substantive definition, in my opinion, is like, does this exist beyond, you know, the, the, the small group of people who have access to the you know GitLab page or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think your definition is very close to mine. That that it's uh, that the platform provide equal footing and equal opportunity for everybody. And uh, so uh, this it takes on a whole bunch of meanings. There's a technical set of meanings, of course. And uh, uh, yeah, you know, we did that paper that looked at decentralization in proof of work networks. And um, nobody had measured it before, but if you look, look at what's going on, there are really a very small number of players who determine what the protocol does. Yeah. And, um, you know, the law enforcement, uh, at the end of the day, all decentralization is essentially to, to make sure that these, these systems cannot be controlled by anyone. And it's trivial for law enforcement to send coordinated subpoenas to 19 mining pools. Not a yeah. problem. And, I mean... Uh, not even law enforcement, just like someone with like, what is it, a, a bag of, of wrenches, right? So exactly, they're, they're exactly. I mean, like it could be, censorship could be happening and we wouldn't even know. Mm -hmm. right? that's, uh, that's the other thing about a lot of networks out there. So um, yeah, so Tezos actually broke a lot of records in the number of participants who actually take part in the protocol. And uh, it's, uh, it's way up there in terms of... Uh, protocols who have uh, large numbers of validators, something that Avalanche prides itself on. It yeah, well. exactly. You know, you guys have taken the mantle on that and really like, you know, I, I think kind of optimized for the right variables, right? Yeah, um, well, well I mean, by, having, by having a different protocol than, than other people, I think we are structurally different. Um, but, but, you know, the other things you focus on are also key, right? These like, these social, um, like nobody is socially in charge. That's just as important as, um, as, uh, as the technicals uh, of the system. And um, so that's a very admirable situation. Um, so, okay, so talking about the space and um, talking about sort of what, what exists out there, what it doesn't, where, what do you see as the current shortcomings of the crypto space? Yeah, ooh, um, I, I guess we're gonna have to do like um, a, a ranking order, right? Because there's, there's quite a bit going on, but you know, there's also what's important. Um, I think there's a few barriers to like sort of mass adoption. The one to harp on obviously is like user experience. Um, you know, I, I, I look at the um, gaming space that's like kind of what my next venture focuses on. And the reason I do that is candidly because like one of the largest contributors to the Tezos Foundation's fundraiser in 2017 was a gaming company. Um, and I had never thought of this before. I'm not really a gamer by, by I guess, culture. Um, but I thought it was kind of curious that these guys were interested in using a public blockchain to basically uh, put their currency uh, on, on Tezos. Um, and once I started to describe their, their issues to me, I realized like, oh my goodness, these people run an economy. <laughs> um, and we talk a lot about how cryptocurrencies are going to revolutionize traditional finance. We talk a lot about how, you know, um, crypto is going to like 
uh, help the masses, you know, kind of um, uh, finally have access to these types of sophisticated financial structures. But there's entire virtual economies that exist that have the same pain points in many ways um, that that cryptocurrencies could kind of assist in their own, you know, their own way. And so why not start there as a, as a testing ground? Um, what I quickly found when I got into that aspect of, of um, development is that basically things like custody um, are still very much lacking. Um, you know, so at the heart of what I'm doing with with Coast, my new company is like really boring stuff, like, you know, deal, dealing with, um, you know, custody solutions and trying to think of better ways to do, um, you know, there's there's no true way to do cold storage with NFTs because you can't just like kind of pick in and get at random. If you need a Black Lotus, you need a Black Lotus, right? Mm -hmm. um, so thinking of ways to do some sort of middle ground between using something like MetaMask, which is not exactly something you, you want to use in at, large for you know millions and millions of dollars in assets um and something that has like sort of the protections of, of cold storage so um like there's still a lot of boring stuff that needs to be addressed in this space is what i, I guess i'm getting at mm -hmm. um and i think that's where i think that's where like a lot of the um limitations of current development and current fads and trends um have stopped is is kind of like once you get to the boring parts like no one really wants to deal with custody <laughs> mm -hmm. it's just objectively not that interesting mm -hmm. um and uh, everyone wants to talk about how they're going to put art on the blockchain or whatever um but no one wants to think about how the average person would would access that once they've you know put it on the blockchain um, okay, can, we, can we drill down on this this is really fascinating so you know uh one thing that's always confused me um has been the slow rate of progress among custody providers, or rather hardware wallet providers. You know, mm -hmm. a Trezor is still a Trezor. Ledger Nanos are still pretty much the same devices they always were. And uh, I just don't see that space moving as fast as it could or as it should. And um, it's, a bit, it's a bit frustrating. Um, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm curious to hear from you what you think uh, are the missing actual building blocks and what you would like to see happen in an ideal Kathleen world. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's probably a good neutral ground. So in like a small business, you have like the cash register, you have the safe, and then you have the bank account, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you need something like a cash register equivalent that has a lock on it. Like effectively, you know, with, with MetaMask and, and Beacon, which is like the Tezos equivalent, like it's fine for, you know, sort of low amounts of volume to be put on those systems. But if you want something that underpins like, you know, a multi-million dollar game, like you know, the market capitalization of, of Magic the Gathering, if you look at the cost of all the cards, is in the order of billions of dollars. Um, and like right now, it's just like, and put it all in the cash register. <laughs> there has to be some middle ground where like the safe is not too far away. Mm -hmm. um, and we just don't really see that with a lot of um, a lot of the, the sort of um, the traditional like cotton coal paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. It's either extremely, you know, vulnerable to hacks and things like this, in which case it's not a very suitable um, arrangement for, uh, you know, extremely large amounts of capital, or it's it's something where it's like so odious to get through that it's it's just inaccessible for like fast transactions. So um, looking for a middle ground uh, to that, like, you know, some, 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 something that's like maybe medium temperature, room temperature storage mm -hmm. um, would be would be kind of ideal. Um, so, I mean, I think that we've got a variation on that with what we call at Coast, like the uncustody solution, which is kind of like it empowers um, people, you know, by breaking up the key into five different parts. Um, it looks a lot more like when you lose your, you know, when you lose your banking credentials, you kind of have like safety nets and you can kind of uh, give some fun to your personal identifying information. And also like maybe you have a fob that, you know, kind of keeps you abreast of this um, and helps you log in. But it's it's kind of a middle ground between um, something that that's extremely vulnerable to hacks and something that's like extremely secure, but to a fault. I see. Have you thought about proof of possession? So something that's in cold storage, but but whose uh, possession you could prove to other people? Yeah, you know, that, there's like this concept of, of having like, you know, sort of proofs, um, uh, you know, in, in the game. Um, mm -hmm. We're kind of, we're still working out the kinks on like how to how to get this to a usable state. And mm -hmm. what I like about my new company is that I mostly delve in the, in the realm of uh, uh, people who don't know anything about crypto. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the, my target demographic is Magic the Gathering players and uh, people who are really into that space. So, um, you know, I kind of uh, I, I kind of just do everything by virtue of making sure that they're onboarded. And it's been very humbling because even basic concepts like, you know, what's a wallet um, are very poorly named. Um, mm -hmm. And so people just don't immediately grok it. And so kind of constructing for that person in mind, I think, will help us with, um, you know, the end user experience. Fantastic. Okay, so going back to what's missing in the space, custody solutions were one. Um, any others? 
Um, yeah, I, I think kind of, uh, uh, I, I guess uh, it's kind of banal to say at this rate because we've been talking about this stuff for years, but like finding finding good use cases, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of deliberation as to what Bitcoin is good for, what's Ethereum good for. Um, they've all positioned themselves in different ways during the years and that's led to different, you know, sort of arcs and, uh, and, and uh, memes around each type of project. Mm-hmm. Um, none are very consistent though. So mm-hmm. it's it, a, an internal narrative that is a bit more consistent is is probably probably something that would help the space propel a little bit forward more more quickly yeah no that i've noticed as well that the goalposts move and the projects are all over the map and um they i don't have a problem with uh you know anybody's position right store of value is a fine thing to be as mm-hmm. long as you say hey we're only a store of value what does happen over time is if somebody's been going through like 15 different uh, adjectives for what they are, um, then when they're on adjective 15, they have a coterie of people who've, who who also still think that they also possess these 14 other adjectives. And you just got to pick a lane at some point. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, so in, in any case, okay, so that's interesting. What do you make of the, the DeFi movement? What's What are your thoughts on DeFi? Where do you think it's headed? Yeah. So, I mean, like traditional, you know, traditional DeFi projects like MakerDAO, for example, are like really awesome, genuinely, because they're kind of a feat of financial engineering. Um, and uh, so, you know, early enthusiasm uh, on my behalf, at least, because when I think of like what's uh, what's transformed about cryptocurrency is it's basically that you're able to kind of take these um, tools that, you know, wealthy people, um, you know, sovereigns, merchants, whatever, have been using for like literally thousands of years, um, and you're able to kind of lower the ticket price, right, for, for these types of financial services. Like that's what's transformative, whether it's mm-hmm. payments, whether it's something a little bit more exotic, um, you know, you're able to kind of lower the ticket price in a way that you've never been able to before. So um, that's what's interesting. I think that's like kind of the banner. It's not like becoming the world's computer. It's not even, you know, underpinning a game that that's cool. Um, It's really just like, you know, lowering the ticket price for different types of financial services. So the notion of decentralized finance, um, at least at first blush, is extremely appealing to me. Um, Where things got weird was like over the summer, you know, finance basically, my definition that I would I would posit is that finance is the technology used to exchange, you know, contractually defined cash flows like there, that's it. Um, What I guess it became in recent weeks and months has been like a weird uh, feat of experimentation to do like an ICO by another name. Like I remember asking, you know, what, what the hell's yield farming? Why do I keep hearing about it? And, you know, someone mm-hmm. explained it to me and I was like, wait, that's just an ICO. Um, so like th- th- it's, it's weird because I think it started off very noble and now we're kind of into like, um, I, I guess, uh, you know, kind of j- jumped a shark a little bit. And it's kind of like how when the Dow w- first debuted in like, whatever 2016 um it was like a really good idea it was a provocative idea it was interesting um the execution as you know firsthand was lacking but like you know the concept is is fine and you know after four years people are actually looking at devs as ways to manage you know i guess assets within a group of people um but it took like four years (laughs) Mm -hmm. after it had this this massive snafu um for the the concept to be redeemed and i do worry about like that arc happening in DeFi with all these different like tokens on tokens and the sort of like uh recursive structure that doesn't really look like finance again if we're positing that finance actually has a definition and the definition is you know about you know exchanging contractually defined cash flows this looks nothing like a governance token on a governance token to do some sort of yield farming like weird Mm -hmm. mechanism because you don't want to do some something called an ICO. Um, so that's that's I, I think it likes I like you know the things that represent uh, more traditional financial projects. I see a lot less of that right now, but I think we'll probably circle back in like a few years and things will become sane again. Yeah, so that's a, that's a very interesting take on this. And uh, yeah, I've been trying to enunciate what makes a good DeFi product versus a versus a fluffy DeFi product. And as you know, there's a lot of testing in production. I don't know what that means. I think it's a euphemism for you know worthless tokens or uh, something of that kind. And um, and it's a, it's a good catch-all like get out of jail free card. And um, and it's uh, it's it's strange and it's it's not going to end well. But I haven't been able to enunciate what what sort of divides the uh, <laughs> what I consider to be good. And I think your definition is a good one, which is is this a, is this a, is this a a way to restructure uh, cash flows, uh, contractually defined cash flows? So where do you see this space in about a year or so? Where do you think we're going to be with DeFi? 
Is it well, going to be gone? Is it going to be flourishing? So no, I think, I think there's a kernel of truth, right? I think that's why people find it compelling. I think, you know, once the tech, like, I think what's nice about the space is that the technology is really caught up. So you've got a lot of projects that have launched over the last like nine months. And like the nice continuum between like most of them is that they all have like respectable technological contributions to the space, whether it's, you know, you guys with like, you know, an awesome, you know, new type of consensus, um, you know, there's, there's different uh, notions of uh, interoperability with like parity, so on and so forth. Like every, every, like it's table stakes now to have good tech. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's kind of a re relatively new, <laughs> relatively new introduction to the space. I think, you know, ultimately, if you look at what this technology is used for, it's used for um, coordination, right? Like, ultimately, why do you have a single ledger? Like, because you need to have some sort of unicity um, in order to, to sort of make it um, useful to people. Uh, and so, you know, you've kind of got at least that there's very few sort of like crazy iota-ish things coming to the fore now. It's it's mostly like pretty patrician. Um, I think now it's it's about time that we figure out like exactly what the stuff is used for. Um, I think you know decentralized finance again is is the one thing that we can represent really well on the internet that other other sort of mechanics and software structures can't. Um, so that's worth kind of looking into. I do think that there's a bit of sobriety needed. I think um, oftentimes a lot of projects come up in, as like solutions in search of a problem. Um, and what's nice is that there have been big strides made um, in sort of recognizing the, uh, you know, recognizing the construct of like a smart contract in, in different legal jurisdictions, for example. Mm -hmm. And like that will lead to some interesting, you know, interesting paradigms, whether it's for security tokens um, or, or if it's for like kind of making more complex transactions that are triggered by smart contracts. Um, you know, we've seen central banks like look to public blockchains as potential solutions for underpinning a, a crypto, a, their own currency, which is huge and unimaginable from like a 2014 perspective. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, I think there's a, a, a kernel of truth there. I think like the problem with this space is that um, there's a lot of engineering that goes like way over its skis. Um, when it comes to like trying to solve business problems that like most people who run businesses in the adjacent space would find like both extremely complicated and unconvincing. Um, and that's kind of like the tragedy of, of the blockchain spaces. It's a lot of solutions in search for a problem. Absolutely. And, and quirks too, like flash loans. So some things are solutions, some things are actual downright problems we never managed to solve. And then there are the <laughs> yeah. quirks like flash loans that are neither solutions nor problems. They're just a weird thing that complicates everything. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I am, I'm, I'm really bullish on, in the DeFi, on the DeFi area. I think the experimentation being done there is fantastic. And, uh, you know, the, uh, you're absolutely right on, uh, on the sobriety needed, on the cleanup needed in the space. Uh, but but there is the core core uh, experimentation going on is fantastic, and we will come up with uh, with things that Wall Street does not have, and uh, we're, we're headed in that direction. Um, so what do you think about uh, about uh, the sort of the so you know what happened this summer is DeFi got big, and then after DeFi got big and then started contracting, uh, the narrative had to change, and people didn't want to immediately acknowledge that they were underwater on DeFi. And so they shifted the narrative to NFTs, and NFTs became really big this summer. So what's your take on NFTs? What's your take on gaming at the second layer as somebody who is squarely at the, in the middle of it and at the, at the, at the, the way front of a new, new coming generation of, of interesting applications there? Yeah, yeah, no, it's funny. Cause like, I remember, so I was pitched, I live in London most of the time and uh, I, I guess I have a pretty decent network there. Cause I got pulled into like a really cool series of meetings with a, um, with a, a company that's owned by like a very famous artist. And so I looked pretty hard into like the whole, um, you know, digital art space uh, really closely. And the, the kind of issue of copy pasting, replicability, so on and so forth has always been at the heart of, you know, the issues with that, like preserving value by people just copy pasting, you know, whatever, whatever sort of virtual art piece you have and then spewing it all across the internet. Um, it's one of the main reasons that digital art has never taken off. Um, so yeah, like NFTs sort of solved that problem, but at the same time, like not really. At the heart of at the heart of digital art is that it just doesn't confer the premium that like physical pieces do, and it doesn't confer the status that physical pieces do. And um, it's kind of nice to see that like you know sort of DeFi art is becoming its own creative space. Like I, I know of one project that's like looking to um, split up a piece of art and then like have 
you know, sort of the ecosystem like construct it and like edit different layers of the art piece so that it becomes its original, you know, sort of collectively owned entity. So it's definitely a lot of experimentation, but I, again, I think it's, I think it's a solution in search of a problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what I like about my company and my, the game that we're, we're working on um, is that basically the, the cards are, you know, uh, I guess, non-fungible assets, right? In the sense that they aren't fungible, um, but they also play like an, an important role in, in um, interacting with the rules engine of the game. So like each card has a power and a property. It's not merely just something that can be, uh, you know, copy pasted <laughs> um, and, and, and sold off for parts um, as it were. So like really what we're trying to address is the issue of, um, I guess, uh, having some sort of, have, having some sort of form of teeth um, in your NFT by having it have like a power when it's associated with a different rules engine, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to that end, we're going to be hopefully publishing a, an SDK and allowing people to like, you know, have their own version of a rules engine if they want to experiment or contest what our, our you know, version of account of events are. Um, but ultimately, like the value that anyone would have from buying a um, you know, a card published by Coast in this game is that we've got a lot of, we've done a lot of thinking on the different properties that each card would have and how it would interact with the balance of the game. And really what you're paying, you know, a premium for hopefully is, is that um, I have a lot of smart people uh, <laughs> on, on my payroll and, and they've done a lot of work on balancing the game. Um, I think that adds for better preservation of value over time than just saying like, oh, look, there's only one of these. It's like, so what? Like, <laughs> um, I, I, there's, I, but yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm. I think that like, you know, the NFT space will kind of like figure its crap out over time, but you know, like the first version of anything, or when you watch a kid, like learn something, it's like, you always have like this very like excitable uh, version of events. And then as you mature and kind of understand what you're trying to get at a little bit more, usually your priorities shift um, mm -hmm. and your values change. I see. So um, I know you have worked with some world-class designers for the game, and uh, uh, I can't wait to, uh, to see it. When is it coming out? It's like, can you give us a little bit of insight into when we can see it in action? Yeah, so over the summer, we ran an alpha trial um, for uh, this game called Emergence. Um, Emergence, you know, the IP was created originally um, by one of my co-founders, Brian David Marshall, who has this sort of storied career. Uh, he started a comic book company when he was in high school and he sold it to Marvel, as you do. And uh, and so, you know, Brian's been around. He, he made this entire new suite of, of IP. And um, he's also worked on the commercial launch of several collectible card games. Um, that's like in the same genre, Magic the Gathering, Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, whatever. Um, and then, you know, alongside him, I have, you know, two Magic the Gathering Hall of Famers, V. Moshowitz and Alan Comer, sort of um, making sure that the card, is the card game is balanced, so on and so forth. Um, so we ran a small alpha trial over the summer. Um, we mostly invited people who were like um, really good gamers and who worked in the industry themselves. Uh, we collected that feedback. <laughs> we reinvested in some parts of it and like run a, you know, sort of six to nine month uh, commercial uh, commercial launch schedule. But, you know, these things take time. They take a lot of money. So, um, you know, kind of kind of mulling our way through while also tending to other, you know, Tezos matters and, um, I, you know, all, all various things. Um, we're also looking into sort of fractional ownership and how we can kind of use the same principles and auction mechanisms um, as we do in the in the game um, for, for yeah, uh, basically establishing ownership um, amongst a group of people for a, a high value asset, for example. Mm -hmm. I see. So you know what I've always thought about uh, when it comes to NFTs? There's an old hacker who uh, used to play Core Wars. I don't know how many of the, the audience members know about Core Wars, but this is a, uh, a game that you play where two people write code where your goal is to kill the other person's code. So I'm, I'm writing things that are essentially trying to destroy your computation while your computation is trying to attack my computation. And it's a, an ongoing thing and you watch it sort of take take fold uh, in real life. Um, so I, what I've always wanted is NFTs with code in them, where the code coming in would, would alter the rules of the game in a very Tezos uh, appropriate uh, you know, twist. Yeah. So have you thought about, uh, about uh, dynamic code injection of this kind? So we, so it's really funny because like I am, you know, I, I think I make good criticisms of the space because I'm mostly guilty of these things. Right. So, um, you know, I, it's, it's, a, it's more about self effacement than it is anything else. When I, when I talk about, um, the shortcomings of the space, it's mostly like self diagnoses. Um, so yeah, at first I was like very excited about like all the things we could do. And then I was like, mm -hmm. 
No, Kathleen. One must think about like the end user experience first. <laughs> so Ooh. I think uh, it's it's what's been refreshing about the last like two years that I've been working on this project um, has been like meeting people who know absolutely nothing about cryptocurrencies. In fact, who are most often like inherently very skeptical of them, um, mm. hearing their grievances and their their fears and just like reducing the scope uh, of, mm. of what parts hit the crypto space and just trying to get like the meat and the heart of uh, what's valuable about inserting them. But yeah, I mean, one of the first ideas we had, we had like some guy come to us who wanted to invest in our company and it was on the condition that uh, we do something that was like very crypto based and like, you know, instead of making like, you know, characters or whatever from the emergence universe, we'd have characters from like the crypto space. And so that was an interesting design space because it could have been really fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I get, I guess you could get a lot of money, right? Because like, you've also got a lot of people with high egos who, um, who really want <laughs> their card to be worth a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, so it wouldn't have been a bad way to, you know, kickstart an economy, just like going off of the egos of various crypto personalities. It's actually a surefire bet you know, to make money. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, I just like quickly got into the weeds on it. And I was like, getting really excited about all the links I could go to. And I was like, wait, I'm never going to launch anything if I, I actually go down that route. <laughs> so um, I think it's a great idea. I think that we should do it. I think it's just like version, you know, 4.0. Of, of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you definitely, I am not your target audience. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> so, uh, I think this is something me and my friends would play for uh, for a little bit. Um, some of them, one of us would get addicted for sure, I think, because Core Wars was addictive. But uh, all you need but, is two. I've learned. <laughs> so, <laughs> I see. Yeah. I see. But but to go mainstream, you need to target. But you know what I what I've always liked about your approach is the external facing side of uh, of crypto. That is, uh, it doesn't pay in this game, I don't think, to turn inwards and uh, to appease the big egos in crypto. And uh, this is a game of taking this this technology to the public. So um, to that end. Um, I, I, let's shift focus a little bit, maybe to things outside um, outside uh, NFTs. Uh, one of the big things happening, or actually, maybe the open-ended question is: What are the big things that you see happening uh, that are uh, outside the realms we've discussed, outside of DeFi? Where do you think uh, the most pull for crypto is coming from? Ooh, yeah, that's a good question. Um... Well, I mean, I hate to, I hate to, like, I, I feel like a lot of these, um, you know, talks just become about reading the regulatory environment, but it has been really encouraging to see, like, I, I can imagine a world where banks will allow you to buy Bitcoin, like, in the next five or six years. That's insane. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's also a little bit, you know, ironic, of course, but, um, but, you know, the PayPal integration, a few of these, a few of these recent events are, like, huge validation for the space, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I, I met Dan Schulman in 2017, and I tried to pitch him on cryptocurrencies, and it was just, like, not heal, not feeling it. So um, it's it's kind of amazing to see a lot of these a lot of these companies, a lot of these entities look at, um, yeah, look at uh, look at kind of public blockchains as solutions to things. Like there was an entire cottage industry that sprung up in 2015, predicated on the idea that no one would ever use um, you know public cryptocurrencies for anything important. So that's like the whole uh, that's the whole uh, I guess thesis behind enterprise blockchain companies. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of cool to see that like. The Tezos, um, you know, Tezos Nomadic Labs, which is based in in Paris, has made a lot of inroads with like getting like the French Gendarmerie, which is like their state police, um, to like use Tezos, the public blockchain, for timestamping. Like that's really it, it's not obviously the most provocative use case. It's not going to like revolutionize anything. Um, they could just as easily use any other timestamping service, but they use a public blockchain, and that's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been a lot of experimentation with CBDCs. Like the first ones that you saw, like if you saw the solicitation or the spec for it, it was just like basically, you know, let's fork a public blockchain and make it kind of toothless. Um, but now people are considering using public blockchains for those purposes. And, um, you know, it's kind of, it's it's frankly really awesome to see. Um, I don't think it is super compatible with the entire like focus or optimization of, of what a cryptocurrency is, which is supposed to be like censorship resistant, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily something that's issued by like um, a central bank. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it is good to see like the, that the technology is becoming more pervasive and more um, accepted as an actual, an actual solution um, to underpin large amounts of value. Yeah. So what, where do you think that's going to go? So what uh, I've had many conversations with central banks um, and uh, oh, by the way, there's a funny, funny part to this. Every time they call, so, you know, I've spoken to them over the years and they were calling at a rate of, you know, I, I don't know, once every two years or so. And after the premier Xi announcement from China, 
the phone started ringing, like emails started coming in, like at an unprecedented rate. And yeah. I would always say, you know, okay, guys, I know why you're calling. It's because of the Chinese announcements, right? Like, no, 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 no. This is, we've always been interested in cryptocurrencies. <laughs> and then yeah. towards the end of the call, they're like, well, you know, we're not here to talk about China at all, but did you talk to them? What do you know what, about what they're doing? And yeah. So, it's very yeah, that feels right. <laughs> they're engaged in some kind of a, a war with each other. They they cannot have a gap in technology, and they don't want anybody else to take the lead. Of course, that makes sense. Where do you think that these efforts are going to go? Well, one of the things I've seen is is uh, they are trying to do the least possible, take the smallest bit possible, take the API but not the architecture, take right. pieces of the architecture but leave central control in place, and so on and so on. And you did allude to the private. Uh, blockchain episodes, and uh, you know they've gone nowhere at all. So, uh, so we have some some past history here. Uh, I'm wondering what what you think is going to happen with these CBDC efforts. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the sort of experiment that the Banque de France is doing uh, with with um, CBDCs or some version thereof, uh, using using Tezos or some version of thereof, is basically like just a you know sort of delivery versus payment. Uh, model of like a tokenized financial asset against a digital euro, you know, issued by the Banque de France. Like mm -hmm. that is very vanilla, right? Mm -hmm. um, I guess where this gets interesting, right, is if you did have, if you did have something like, you know, a digital dollar, um, you know, you, you could really do something um, that's revolutionary because you could trigger like complex, you know, payments. And basically the world was changed when credit cards were introduced because all of a sudden you had like the velocity of, of payments go like sky high. If you actually have that paired with, you know, something that's, final, um, you could really, you could really trigger a lot of complex payments really, really quickly. And that would actually change a lot of the composability of, of the global financial system. Um, but that's kind of like unleashing a huge monster, right? So um, it's, I, I think, um, I think all these like central banks and everything who are, who are kind of experimenting with this know in the back of their mind that this would unleash like a lot of, of newness into the system. And they're rightfully, you know, pretty concerned about what that would look like. Um, I think what's funny is that you have some, I guess, some jurisdictions that are like trying to pick winners really early. And then you have some that are being like, I think, rightfully very cautious about what this would look like. Um, but yeah, basically, the Chinese question sort of accelerated everything. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's kind of weird to speak to these groups. And I, I think, you know, you and you've probably spoken to more of them than me. Um, certainly, certainly you have, but, uh, but it's kind of fun to see like over the years, how like they go from be, like hyper cautious until like one person says like, yeah, I'll do it. And then, oh my God. <laughs> we all have to do it. And we've all, all, we've always been interested. That's the best part. So, yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Um, um, I for one embrace our, our, <laughs> our crypto overlords, yeah. but uh, yeah, no, I also agree with you that uh, the moment the, even, even as something as small as the API is cryptoized, then we will, we will be able to have our assets with their properties interface with their assets uh, easily and naturally. And that's going to be huge for all of us. It's going to be well, huge. Space. A, a, a big part of the takeoff in the fintech space in London um, is, is this whole like notion of open banking and like kind of having APIs open to developers. And that's, that's like spurred a lot of really interesting um, really interesting progress in that area of the world. And now you see like Goldman Sachs with their like, I think Marcus platform is trying to do something very similar. So it's kind of like, you know, progressively happening in the old version of, of finance. And um, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, basically once we're able to like exchange value using like, you know, rules and, and embedded in the software, like that's just going to take off tenfold yeah. Yeah, to your yeah. point. Absolutely. I think it's inevitable. Uh, what about other asset classes? Are there asset classes that you're excited about other than CBDCs, uh, more creative ones, ones yeah. that use the power of smart contracts? Yeah, I mean, um, it's funny, like in 2014 or 2015, like my hot idea was using, um, you know, I don't even think Ethereum was out yet, um, but I wanted to do something with like peer to peer, um, like weather insurance. Like weather insurance is one of the most like ab absurdly useful, but like also extremely overpriced yeah. um, things that you could do to sort of um, yeah, rather a lot of industries are predicated on the weather, but it sort of baffles the mind as to why people don't insure against weather. Mm -hmm. You know, something that's like a peer to peer weather insurance platform would be really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and I've yet to see anyone really propose that for Tezos or otherwise, but like there are some really low hanging fruits when you look at like insurance, which is obviously derivative of, of finance in a lot of important ways. Um, and I think once I start to see more pragmatic, um, more pragmatic sort of projects and, and companies that are using a blockchain to, you know, kind of uh, distribute risk or, or um, 
make for interesting um, peer-to-peer agreements, I think I'll be a little bit a little bit more excited. But those are the types of things I'll, I'll be really happy to see on, on Tezos or otherwise. Yeah, I cannot wait for InsureTech. InsureTech is also very, very interesting. That's a, that's a space where the value add from the big players is not as big as one would imagine. And, uh, and they're, they're seem ripe, ripe for, for, uh, for disruption. I've said this for many years, by the way. I've been saying it for four years at least that you know, insurance is, uh, is one of the big key areas and nobody seems to be doing anything whatsoever. There's a lot of talk and no action on the ground. And the yeah. blockchains are so fantastic for that area. So uh, let's see. Um, okay, so since we are about to wrap up soon, uh, let's end on, a, on, on, on words of advice from someone who has seen it all, from the very, very lows at times to some <laughs> of the biggest highs. So uh, what's your advice to people going into crypto? Yeah, well, I think I think you rightfully said that, you know, Tezos is the highest DPS at some point, which is drama per second. Um, so <laughs> it's not it's not the metric we're most proud of, but, you know, I'll take my superlatives where I can get them. Um, and uh, so, yeah, um, in the words of Ariana Grande, I've, I've been through some bad shit. I should be a sad bitch. Who would have thought it would turn me into a savage? Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, the advice I usually get, which I think you actually gave to me at some point, is like, don't read the comment section. You know, uh, that's that's something that we can all kind of learn from. Um, you know, one thing I, I do with, with Tezos things is like, I sort of have a board of directors of my life and, you know, people who keep me honest and keep me in check. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just check in with people who I admire, um, who, you know, keep track of my, uh, professional career and give me some good advice when I need it, you know, tell me to ignore things when I, when I should ignore them. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, just like having a group of people who like, you know, if they tell you that you're screwing something up, like take it to heart and, you know, for the rest kind of ignore, you know, what, what you can ignore. Um, it's harder than it sounds. And a lot of this is very much like public facing. So, um, the amount of sort of vitriol on the internet is, is, is something that you have to learn to cope with. Um, you know, I have like less generalizable pieces of advice, like never going to business with Johan Gebers, you know, it's like, you know, it, it goes from like very wide, to, like very narrow. <laughs> um, I think figuring out, you know, where, where you have isolated screw ups and like sort of patterns in your, you know, behavior that lead to things going awry is an important part of self-reflection. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I think the most, the most easily uh, generalizable is like, you know, don't listen to, don't listen to, you know, just everyone who wants to give you input. Everyone's a critic. Um, really try to figure out who you solicit advice and feedback from and listen to those people carefully. Um, you know, once you've designated them as people you're going to listen to. Exactly. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for taking the time. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and wisdom. So, uh, okay. So thank you again. And uh, thank you to the audience of the uh, Money Dance series is coming to an end, but the, the lecture parts are coming to an end. Hackathon is going to continue for some time. Uh, so stay tuned to avolabs.org for the announcements. And uh, you can find Kathleen on Twitter, right, Kathleen? Yep, I'm a bright woman. And then if you want to email me, my you know, email is just Kathleen at Tezos.com. So no secrets there. Uh, <laughs> feel free to ping me. Happy to happy to answer questions. Great. Thank you all very much. Take care. Thank you.